yes, yes, Are you yes, ready yes. to declare your position in the house of the Lord? Okay, let's do this now. Come on, put your hands together. Like this.
with your father right now. Commune with your father right now. Together we say, Father, here I am once again in wonder and all amazement. So grateful for all that you do.
identity, oh God. We release it to you right now, our Father. Yes, and we ask that you will take it and use it to your glory, oh God. Yes, to the glory of your name, our Father. Continue to stare us, oh God, to seek after you, to watch for you, to look for you, Lord God, in spaces where you can be found. Oh God, we, right now we release control unto you. And we ask that you will take charge of our lives, our Father. Take charge, oh God, and make us into that which you have created us to be. For in Jesus' name we have worship. And all God's people say a big Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together Amen. wherever you are for the King of Kings Amen. and the Lord of Lords. For he's worthy of all our praise. Yes. May the Lord God bless you. Stay tuned. Wow, we are getting into a time that we love at Mavuno Church and that's our time to give. This is a time when we bring our tithes and offerings, when we are, are bring some of our material, uh, you know, resources and we bring them to the Lord's house and the details for how you can give are, are on your screen. And I just wanted to share something that stood out for me in the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul I was in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and he says something powerful because he had a chance to address the temple. Here's what he says. He says, he's speaking of God and he says, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. He's saying that God doesn't need anything and yet God asks us to give. Why? I realize that the reason God invites us into a life of generosity, a life of, you know, discipline with our tithes, a life of generosity with our offering. It's not because he needs what we have. God doesn't need anything, as the Apostle Paul says. It is because there are things he desires to accomplish in us. And our giving, our releasing of money, of material wealth, is a big part of how uh, he, he, he does those things that he's looking to accomplish in us. So as you give, I want you to understand that, you know, God is inviting you into a place where he's working on you, he's shaping you, he's molding you, and he's doing that through your faithfulness in giving. Let me pray for you, even as you give. Our Lord and our King, we thank you for every promise that is connected to the act of giving, to the act of, of tithing, bringing, uh, you know, 10% of our income into the Lord's house. I thank you because you're faithful and true and you keep all your promises. So for every man, every woman, even the children who might be giving as they watch this, I thank you that you will fulfill every promise that you have spoken over us in your word as we give. We thank you and we worship you, our Lord and our King, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your generosity and God bless you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is where you're watching us from. Welcome to Mavuno Church. Uh, we're so glad that you're able to join us uh, in our worship experience for this week. 
Uh, this is the first Sunday of August, and we're so glad that you're able to be with us. My name is James Mushai. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors in the Mavuno Church uh, family uh, under the leadership of our senior pastors, Pastor Karo and Pastor Muraidi Wanjao, who are the amazing, incredible spiritual parents uh, that God has appointed over our family. It is my honor to bring to us God's word uh, this month, and, and we're starting a new sermon series today uh, that we are calling X Factor. X Factor, superpower your life. X Factor, superpower your life. Those are the conversations we'll be having this month. And I actually want us to dive right into uh, the scriptures. And I'm going to read for us. I'll be reading from the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to read verse 4 to verse 8. This is what it says. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. The Bible is talking about persecution that came to the early church in Jerusalem and the believers were scattered abroad. That's what he's talking about, that they preached the good news wherever they were scattered to. Verse 5 continues, Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Verse 7 says that many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Listen to that. Let me say it again. So there was great joy in that city. You know that statement? It's a very simple statement, but it is as simple as it is powerful. There was great joy in that city. And I want to tell you why it's a powerful statement. This statement is saying that on account of the entry of a single individual into a city, the city of Samaria, that, that city was turned upside down. The city was transformed and it was full of joy, not for many reasons, but simply because this one guy, his name was Philip, because he had entered and spent some time in that city. It was completely transformed and the citizens were filled with joy. You know, as I thought about this scripture, I realized, you know, I asked myself, what would that look like? Is that even possible? You know, we are recording this uh, in a place in Kenya just outside uh, of Nairobi, our capital city. And I remember thinking to myself, what would it look like? Uh, you know, imagine Nairobi transformed because one man or one woman paid a visit to the city of Nairobi. Imagine Kampala transformed because someone uh, visited. Imagine Bujumbura or Kigali. Imagine Paris or New York. Imagine Diani or Mombasa. Imagine Tunis or Mogadishu. Is it even possible that, that an individual can enter into a space and it is completely transformed just by the presence of that person and on account of what activities they undertake. I, I, I read that statement and it blew my mind. The city was full of joy. Fortunately for us, the Bible actually tells us what Philip did. And I believe that the things he did are the reason that the city was left joyful. The things that he did are the reason the city was left joyful. And there are several things that I want to highlight for us uh, that Philip did in the city of Samaria. It's recorded in the portion of scripture we've just read. The first thing that, uh, that Philip did is he taught. The Bible tells us that he told them about the Messiah. He shared the message that Jesus Christ, this, this man who had not too long ago been crucified and died in Jerusalem and was raised from the dead, he told them that the message of the Messiah, that this man was the man who had come to die so that they could be saved. So, so Philip taught in the city of Samaria. But the second thing is that Philip performed miracles. The Bible tells us that the people were eager to hear his message that's the message about the Messiah. But they were also eager to see the miraculous signs he did. Philip performed miracles. Now, just for the avoidance of doubt, I want to give us a, a, just a simple definition of what a miracle is. A miracle is this. It is a supernatural occurrence. It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. A miracle is when something happens that could not have happened naturally. Is when something happens that can only be the outcome of a supernatural power sort of, you know, entering into a situation. And so we see that the second thing that Philip did, the first thing is that he taught. The second thing is that he performed miracles. The third thing we see is that Philip brought freedom. Philip brought freedom. I'm telling you the things he did because I'm convinced that those things are the reason the city was joyful when he left. Philip brought freedom. We see that 
you know, the Bible tells us that many evil spirits were cast out. There were people who had been living in Samaria and they had been living under the oppression of evil spirits. And somehow Philip interacts with these men, these women, maybe children, I don't know. He doesn't tell us specifics. But on account of their interactions with Philip, the demons, the evil spirits are forced to come out of them. In fact, the Bible says that they were screaming as they left the people that they had been oppressing. And so Philip brings freedom to people who have been oppressed by evil spirits. And the final thing I see is that Philip brought healing. Philip brought healing. That there are people who had carried certain infirmities, certain sicknesses, and the Bible says that many who were paralyzed, not one, not two, not a few, many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. That in the time that Philip was in the city of Samaria, because of his presence there, because of his activations and the things he was doing there, many people were healed during his presence, uh, during the time when he was present in that city. And the outcome of that is that the city was full of joy. That's why the story ends with that. How, how is that even possible? I read that story and, and I can't help but wonder, how, how can that happen? How can that be possible for an individual? How is it possible for Philip to live like he did and to have the kind of impact that this story is recording for us? How does a human being perform miracles? How does someone who's a man like you or me, you know, a woman, a, a, a regular person, how do they get to the place that they are able to do things that are clearly and obviously impossible? How are people who are paralyzed or lame, people with conditions that have defeated medicine, how are those kind of people healed on account of their interaction without medical intervention, their interaction with Philip? How, how, how is that even possible? Maybe you're listening to this and, and you're a bit confused because do evil spirits even exist? You know, when he talks about setting people free and evil spirits being cast out, do they exist? And if they do, how can it be that they respond to the presence of a human being? How can it be that there is a man who is able to exercise authority over them and to instruct them to live or to cast them out, as the Bible tells us, that they flee from the lives of the people they have been oppressing? How are these things possible? But more importantly, what is it about Philip that makes it possible for him to accomplish these things? It is clear from this story that Philip was living a life full of supernatural occurrences. His life was packed with supernatural outcomes. It's, it is clear that Philip possessed a, a, a certain X factor. There was something that Philip possessed. There was a certain X factor that made it possible for him to, 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 you know, to produce an irregular, supernatural, abnormal outcomes or results in his life. Up there, he had certain abilities that made it possible for him to turn an entire city upside down. And that's what we'll be looking at in our sermon series this month, X Factor, Superpower, Your Life. We want to we wanna look closely are these kinds of outcomes, these kinds of realities, these kinds of supernatural, you know, em em encounters and results and to see what can we learn from them. I don't know where you're at in your life as you watch this. It's possible that as you're watching, you are completely convinced, you know, you have little to no confidence in the Christian faith. Maybe you believe differently. You, 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 you ascribe to a different system of belief, of faith, and of worship. Maybe you do not believe in the existence of spiritual things. You do not believe in the existence of God or the devil or angels. You believe that the, what you can encounter physically, what we are experiencing physically, is all there is to life. Maybe that's where you're at as you're watching this. And if this is you, you know, possibly we almost lost you at evil spirits. But I'm glad that you have come along this far. And my invitation to you is that we'll just tag along. Uh, you know, we won't be too long. In about 25 to 30 minutes, we'll have brought our message to a close. And I'd ask you just tag along and see if there is something in this message for you today. It's possible that as you're watching this, you're a Jesus follower. You have heard about supernatural encounters. You have heard about miracles. You've read the stories in your Bible. But you have many questions. You're unsure and uncertain what to believe what to think about those occurrences, what, you know, what to trust. You, you don't know how to interpret any of these things, but I'm glad that you're watching this today. But it's also possible that you're here as a follower of Jesus and you're super, super, super excited that we are having this conversation because you recognize that it is important for us as Jesus followers 
to, to understand truths, the truths that we'll be talking about concerning the X factor in the life of the believer. Whatever category you're in, however it is, you, you know, you found yourself watching this, whether you're a regular part of the Mavuno online community, or whether you attend one of our Mavuno uh, in-person communities, but maybe you didn't make it today and you're watching this online, or maybe you've, you, know, you just stumbled upon this video somehow uh, and it appeared in a random way. I'm glad that you're watching. We're glad that you get to join with us in our worship experience. And my invitation to you is that you'll just come along with us as we have this conversation. X Factor, superpower your life. Welcome to X Factor. We'll be learning from the book of Acts like we've already read. Now, this book reads like an action thriller. It's power-packed and has some dramatic twists and turns. Uh, you know, it leaves you wondering, especially if you are reading it for the first time, it leaves you wondering, how is this going to end? There's so much drama. There's so much tension. There's so many things happening. Uh, there are so many supernatural things that are happening. You know, it follows different servants of God who somewhere along the way acquire this X factor. They acquire this capacity for supernatural outcomes. They acquire this capacity to express and, 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 and you know, uh, you know to, to express certain supernatural things in their lives, to, to produce certain supernatural results. And the story is following them from one town to the other, from one community to the other. And the one thing that's clear is that they contain a certain X factor that is making it possible for them to do some dramatic things. That's what you see throughout the book of Acts. And as we go through this month, we'll be looking for lessons that we can learn concerning the X factor. We'll be trusting God to unlock the life that he desires for us as we begin to understand who we are in him. And I'm really, truly excited about that. So back to Philip. If you're new to the Bible, you know, this may sound new, this may sound weird, this may sound, you know, even unbelievable. Like, what are, you, what are these guys going on about? You might be wondering, uh, you know, for those of us who have been followers of Jesus for some time, this story will not be new. We know that in the Bible, in the biblical account, there are many, you know, records, there are many places where, where, where supernatural things are happening. There are many miracles that are recorded in the scripture. So for you, it won't be new if you've been a Jesus follower for long. Maybe you've even interacted with them at a personal level. The reality of supernatural activity will not be new to you. Or the fact that God allows, apparently, men and women to carry the X factor that makes it possible for them to live life in a way that seems like, you know, it almost seems like they have superpowers. There are things they are doing that are impossible for regular people, that are impossible if, even for them, if they were regular people, but somewhere along the way, they possess, they receive, they acquire a certain X factor that causes them to live in a different way. Along the way, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we have come, come up with different ways of identifying the X factor. We have come with different ways of branding people who clearly uh, you know, have the X factor as a part of their life. We we'll often speak of things like anointing. When we, when we are talking about someone who has the X factor, we will say that this person is anointed. We have terminologies and phrases and, and ways that we speak about our conviction that God allows people to carry this X factor. Many times we'll describe certain people, often leaders with specific positions in the church, carrying certain titles and responsibilities. We'll refer to them as man of God. We'll refer to them as woman of God. We'll refer to them as being powerful or mighty or anointed, like I said earlier. These are all titles that we place, and there are many others, I'm sure, on those who demonstrate a clear presence of the X factor in their lives, those whose lives are super-powered and they are clearly operating in a manifestation of the X factor. That's where I want us to start today. And we're going to start our sermon series by answering two foundational questions that will direct us into the rest of the conversations that we will be having through the month of August. The first question is this, what is the X factor? What is this thing that makes it possible for our lives to be superpowered? What is the X factor. What is this thing that changed Philip's life so that evil spirits responded to him in obedience? That when they fled from the people they had been oppressing, they didn't just flee, they fled screaming. That they had encountered something greater than them that caused them to flee while screaming. What is it that Philip had received? What is it that had happened to Philip? And to answer this question, I want, us to, I want to take us back to the very beginning of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we're reading from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. This is Jesus speaking 
before he went uh, into heaven before uh, he was, he, he, you know, he had died, he had been crucified, he, he was buried, he was raised up from the dead and spent some time interacting with his followers before he was taken up into heaven. And this conversation happens just before he was taken up into heaven. And here's what it says, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Before Jesus left the earth, he left a promise to his disciples. He made his followers a promise. He said, hey, I, I need you to wait in Jerusalem because there's something coming and it's going to come while you're here. He said to them that you're going to receive a gift and that gift is the Holy Spirit. And this is the X factor. In fact, to be more accurate, we, we, we should be saying he is the X factor. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is, is, is God. Uh, you know, God exists as a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the third person in the trinity, and he is fully God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one is not greater or more God than the other. And so the Holy Spirit is fully God. And, and, and Jesus left a promise. He said, hey, I want you to wait in Jerusalem because God is going to send you a helper. God is going to send you a part of him. He's going to deposit upon you his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the X factor. This is who transformed the life of Philip. This is who makes it possible for the lame to walk as they interact with Philip, for the paralyzed to rise up and be strengthened, for those who are sick to be healed, for those who are possessed or, or oppressed by evil spirits to be set free because uh, Philip has interacted with them. The power that Philip was operating in, the capacity, you know, it looks like Philip is doing impossible things according to the story. And he is. Why? Because God is living within him. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. And so he's able to do impossible things because with men, some things are impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. He is exercising the power of God that God has allowed him to possess and allowed him, uh, you know, to sort of demonstrate. And God is moving powerfully through him. So the first question is who or what is the X factor? The question actually should be, who is the X factor? And the answer is that the X, the X factor is the Holy Spirit. The book that we've read is called the Acts of the Apostles. It focuses significantly on two apostles, Peter and Paul. Although there are other characters whose stories are recorded in there, among them Philip, who we are focusing on today. Some people have said, you know, the book could be called the Acts of Peter and Paul because at the beginning we talk a lot about Peter and his ministry. And at the end we talk a lot about Paul and his ministry. And both of them are operating in power, in signs and wonders. Miracles are happening as they, uh, you know, as they are doing their ministry in different contexts. But in reality, the most accurate definition for this book, or the most accurate title, rather, for this book would have been the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because every supernatural encounter, every impossibility that is being confronted is happening on account of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the people that we are reading about. So that's our first question. The, the X factor is the Holy Spirit. The second question is this, who qualifies? Who qualifies for the X factor? And to answer this question, allow me to take us to chapter 6 of Acts. I'm going to read from verse 2 to 4. Acts chapter 6, verse 2 to 4, also in the New Living Translation. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Let me tell you something about Philip, this superhero of ours. Before Philip was a big shot transforming entire cities, before he was anywhere near becoming this prominent church leader, teaching and doing amazing things that we are reading about, his role was that he was part of a feeding, he was part of a team that was overseeing a feeding 
program, when the apostles brought this solution, uh, you know, for raise up a team, let's appoint a team that will manage a food program to support the widows in the church, the first mention of Philip is a little lower after that because he was one of the people who was mentioned and placed uh, uh, upon that team. He was one of the people who became a member of that team. His role was what we could call a peripheral role. As compared to the role of James and John and Peter, as compared to the roles of the apostles, as compared to the role of Paul later on, his role in the church in Jerusalem is what would have appeared as a peripheral role, not a role that is at the center of the community of faith. He was appointed, in fact, to this role because the key leaders of the church, the apostles, needed to focus on, on, on certain significant leadership roles. And they said that we need to focus on prayer and the teaching of the word. But when the apostles gave qualifications for the men who would run the food program that needed to be implemented, they required three things of them. This is the J, this is these are the requirements that they asked that the CV, uh, you know, for the person applying for this position must have. They said that this person must be well respected, full of the spirit and wisdom. In other words, Philip was selected for the leadership role because he already had manifestations of the X factor in his life. He already had manifestations of the X factor in his life. If someone had said, you know, who do you think was anointed in the early church? My modern day thinking today would, have, would make me jump to the leaders at the center, would make me jump to James, make me jump to John, make me jump to Peter, the apostles. But in reality, as I read this scripture closely, I find that I would be mistaken in that assumption that only the key or the central leaders of the church would have been anointed, would have qualified for the X factor. As I look at the life of Philip, I see that he didn't receive the X factor when he became a teacher in Samaria, when he became a key leader who's leading a community of new believers in the city of Samaria. He did not receive the X factor when he needed to perform miracles in Samaria to heal those who are sick and those who are lame and paralyzed. He didn't even receive the X factor when he needed to lead and to, to be one of the leaders of a feeding program. That's not when he received the Holy Spirit. I see that being full of the Holy Spirit was a requirement for him to enter that role, which means even before he was in a leadership role, he was already full of the Holy Spirit. The question we are answering is this, who qualifies for the X factor? Who qualifies for the X factor? And the answer that I see when I look at the life of Philip, when I see how he was operating in power when he left Jerusalem, where he had had a small peripheral role in the church in Jerusalem, my, the answer that I see is that every follower of Jesus qualifies for the X factor. In other words, and this is one of the most critical lessons you will ever learn, the anointing is available to every believer, not just those in upfront ministry. Allow me to say that again. The anointing is available to every believer, not just those in upfront ministry. When we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which we read earlier, I see that Jesus did not create any caveats. He did not say that you guys will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you can lead the other people who will not have power. He did not say that you guys are the only ones. Jesus was, was committing, was making a promise that was going to be a promise for every one of his followers. The promise wasn't just to the apostles. In other words, the, the anointing is available to every believer, not just those in upfront ministry. You see, Philip's initial assignment was a background assignment, but he was already full of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're listening to this and you're not yet convinced. You've read your Bible and you're convinced. That, you know, certain people, the people who get to hold a microphone, like I'm holding right now, and to teach or to do prayer meetings and crusades, those are the ones who qualify for the anointing and to carry the X factor. Uh, in case I haven't convinced you, I want us to read about a gentleman who was, uh, you know, Philip's teammate. He served with him on that food program team that we talked about. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. This is what it says. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. His official job title, this man called Stephen, is that he was part of the food, you know, running the food program. Uh, some versions call it waiting on tables. He was doing a role that many of us would not con consider a central pillar in the running of a community of faith, in the running of our different churches and different worship spaces. He could have thought of himself as a background person. He was not one of the apostles. He was not one 
of the teachers, he did not have an upfront ministry assignment, this man, Stephen. But the Bible clearly tells us that he was full of God's grace and power, performing amazing miracles. Listen, the anointing is available to every believer, not just to those in upfront ministry. If you're watching this and you're a follower of Jesus, it, I'm saying to you that it is God's desire for you that you will carry the power of God, that you too will receive the X factor and that he will carry you and that through you, he will bring freedom and joy even in the same way that he did to the city of Samaria through Philip, the man whose life we are looking at. The problem is that too many followers of Jesus today have settled for a life devoid of power. Too many believers have settled for a life devoid of power. They have concluded that the X factor is limited to so and so. And usually that so and so is someone who has an official job title of pastor, like the one I carry has an official, you know, deep sounding or, or important sounding title, apostle, bishop, evangelist. And we, and we believe that those are the people that God desires to anoint so that they can carry the X factor for the rest of us. And I'm saying to you that you are sorely mistaken. The infilling with the Holy Spirit is available to every single one of us. God desires that every single one of us will walk in the Spirit, will, will live a life that is marked by demonstrations of the X factor in different ways in our lives. God desires for us to live in power and with authority. I'm going to say this one more time because this is a critical lesson for today. The anointing is available to every believer. The anointing is available to every believer, not just those in upfront ministry. And my challenge to you is that you will not settle for less. Come on, if you're watching this with somebody, just tell them don't settle for less. If you're watching this in one of our campuses uh, and you're having a watch party, Mavuno Nakuru, I see you, Mavuno Diani, I see you. Uh, just, just you know, nudge someone and tell them don't settle for less. Tell them the anointing is available to every believer, not just those in upfront ministry. I want to lead us in, the, in, in two prayers as we bring this to a close. And I want to pray for you and I want to invite you to start praying for yourself from today. I want you first to pray for greater dimensions of God's anointing in your life. I want you to ask God for, to fill you with the Holy Spirit even to a place of overflow. I want you to tell the Lord, I want more of you in my life. Holy Spirit of God, I want you to come and fill me fully. I want demonstrations and, and, and things that clearly illustrate the presence of the X factor in my life. That's the first prayer that I will pray for us. And allow me to just pray uh, 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 that prayer right now. Our Lord and our King, we thank you that you desire to fill us with your spirit, that you desire that we walk in power, that we exercise dominion on your behalf. And you have made that possible by making the Holy Spirit available to every single one of us. My prayer, my Lord and my King, over every person watching this today, I pray for just a fresh outpouring of you, Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you will stir us up and cause us to desire more of you and to not settle for less. There are situations in our lives that need the, your presence and your power for us to break through and to receive everything that you intend for us. I pray that you will not allow us to settle and to say this is just how things should be. That you will cause us to desire and to hunger for you so that, Lord, as we, as we seek more of you, as you fill us more and more, we will live victorious and accomplish every assignment that you have created us for, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So that's the first prayer. The second prayer is connected. I want, you to, I want to pray for you that God will empower you, the Holy Spirit will empower you in every role. Many times we believe that the anointing or the presence of the Holy Spirit is limited to our ministry functions, to things that are connected to church. But the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit, you know, when you're, when you're living in the Spirit, when you're operating in the Spirit, in every area of your life, uh, there should be a response to the presence of the power of God in your life. So it should be felt in your family, in your parenting. There should be results and outcomes in your workplace that people are saying there's something different about so and so. It's not just a spiritual thing. It's meant to cover every area of your life in your marriage and your parenting, your health. Every area of your life should encounter and be impacted by the presence of the X factor, the Holy Spirit in your life. So let me just pray for you once more. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you because, because you're available to us as followers of Jesus. I pray my Lord and my King that there will be clear demonstrations of your power and of your presence in the life of every man, every woman, every child who's watching this, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, 
that you will, your, your presence and your power will be made manifest in every situation, in every function, in every role that you have, sat, uh, that you have placed us in to the glory and to the honor of your name. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your love for us. We thank you for the blessing and the privilege of receiving you and you living in us. And what a blessing and what a privilege it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you so, so much. I'm looking forward to uh, going through the rest of this sermon series. We'll be getting the, into the second installment uh, next week. But for now, thank you for worshiping with us. I'm Pastor James Mushai from Mavuno Church. God bless you and have a wonderful week ahead.